Okay, so let's all come together here, wrapping up derivatives. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about applications of derivatives. And so um, just a reminder, if you were out, you can always go back and watch the videos that I record during this class. Okay, we know that slope is rate of change. Okay, we're going to talk about specifically how that applies to distance, velocity, um, and eventually we'll talk about acceleration. All right, so we know that distance equals rate times time. You've probably seen this formula um, written like this, D equals RT. But I'm mostly concerned about the rate today, in our case, velocity. So if you isolated R here, what would that equal? D over T. So average velocity, we're not actually averaging numbers, meaning we're not adding them up and dividing by two. What we're doing is the average rate of change, which is just slope, okay? So it's kind of like we're doing delta D over delta T. Remember, delta means change in. Or we could do some distance, say D2 minus D1 over T2 minus T1. And if this looks like slope formula, it should. It's just a basic slope, okay? So you do average velocity over an interval. If you notice on this first example, it says a billiard ball is dropped from a height of 100 feet, and then it gives you the formula right here, S of T equals negative 16 T squared plus 100, and then it says find average velocity, all right, um, over the time interval. Anytime you're doing average velocity or average rate of change, it will be over an interval, okay? so. The way we're going to do this is just S of, what does S stand for, by the way? Anybody know? So S stands for a lot of words. In this case, it stands for position. I should have written that first, position. So S of T, sometimes that's written as X of T or Y of T even, but S of T is position. It doesn't stand for speed or slope or anything like that. It's position. So we're basically saying the position at time t equals 2 minus the position at time t equals 1, that would give us the total change in position, okay, over the change in time. This right here is called the difference, whoa, sorry. This is something we're going to call, uh, here we go, I'll write it over here, the difference quotient. I just want you to be familiar with this phrase. So if I say write the difference quotient, you know what I mean. So the reason it's called difference quotient is because it's a quotient, right? It's dividing by two subtractions. Something subtracted over something subtracted. All right, so let's apply this to our problem. So we do negative 16 times 2 squared plus 100. I'm just getting these numbers from my position function over here. It's kind of off the board a little bit. There it is. All right, so that's the position at time t equals 2. And then we got to go minus, and I'm going to use parentheses here, negative 16 times 1 squared plus 100 all over 2 minus 1. And it's actually uh, totally acceptable to leave your answer like this. You don't have to simplify. But why don't you guys go ahead and get out your calculator. We're going to use it here in just a second and simplify that. If you don't have your calculator, I want you to be thinking about what are the units that we're going to use here. Okay, what are you guys getting? 
Negative 48. Me too. So what are the units? Negative 48 what? Feet per second. Now in physics, you're probably used to doing meters per second. So that's just always pay attention to your units. It's more, more often we're going to be in feet than meters, but we could be in either. Okay, so all of that is actually stuff you've already done. Okay, so that's just basic slope, average velocity. A rock. All right, instantaneous velocity is the new stuff. Okay, so for instantaneous velocity, this is I rock, instantaneous rate of change. And the way you do this is you calculate average velocity over a very small interval, meaning your delta T should be basically zero. And what does this look like? What word does this make you think of? A limit. Okay, and we found that when you take the limit of our average rate of change, it gives you the same thing, and we call this now a derivative. It gives you the same thing as instantaneous rate of change, which is a derivative. So if you know a position function, you can take the derivative to find the velocity function. That will represent all the instantaneous velocity. So this really opens up a lot of problems that you couldn't do before. Okay, real quick, you do need to know that speed is the absolute value of velocity. So we got a negative velocity over here. Okay, that kind of makes sense because this thing is falling down. So the speed would just be regular 48 feet per second. Speed does not have a negative in front of it ever. All right, S of T. Remember, S of T stands for position. You need to know that. S of T is position. It's not speed. It's not slope. In general, the position is 1 half times gravity times T squared plus the initial velocity, V sub zero or V naught is the initial velocity. Okay, plus S sub zero, which is the initial, initial height. Okay, so back in our previous problem, notice there was no, I know I'm kind of jumping around here, but there was no middle term here. That's because there was no initial velocity. It was just dropped. It wasn't thrown. And the initial height was 100, which they tell you in the problem. So in this new example that we have about a diver, it says at time t equals zero, a diver jumps off the diving board that is 32 feet above the water. Okay, that's where they're getting 32, right there from the initial height. What is this diver's initial velocity? Look at where it comes from in the example. V sub zero t, 16. This problem does have an initial velocity, and they're not asking you that. I'm asking you so that you understand why the formula works the way it does. All right, where does this beginning negative 16 come from? Yeah, and G stands for gravity. And so I told you guys we're going to more than likely, this should be squared, by the way. I always mean to fix that, and I forget every year. Um, so gravity um, in feet per second squared is negative 32. You're probably more used to meters, but like I said, we just have to deal with it. And all of that's just to show you why the formula is the way it is, okay? And what does S of T represent? Position, okay. So when this says, when does she hit the water? Okay, it's asking for a time. What is the time? And what does she hit the water? How does that relate to her position? So when the whole thing becomes zero, really. So when her S of T, when is her position at zero? When is she zero uh, feet above the water? Okay, and we're going to just solve this equation. Negative 16 T squared plus 16 T plus 32. And we're going to set that equal to zero, and we're going to solve and get a t value. Okay, how would you solve this by hand? Factor or, if all else fails, what formula could you use? Quadratic formula. We're going to practice the calculator a little bit today. So I want to remind you of how to solve an equation on your calculator. Okay, you're going to go to F2, solve, and then you're going to type this in. So negative 16, and see the T right here? You can use T or you can use X. It doesn't really matter. Okay. 
Wait, where is Saul? It's up in F2, algebra. Okay, so if you look at yours and um, hit second home, see how mine changed? You can customize this if you wanted to. But if you don't want to customize it and you just want it to be the normal, um, see what I see? I'm going back and forth here. Either way, you're going to select algebra, but you can customize those tabs to be in like whatever order you want and to do all sorts of stuff. This is the default right here, though. Okay, you got to go equals zero. I'm sorry. Oh, instead of plus 16. Thank you. That's what I get for trying to do too many things at once. Here we go. All right. So we need to go back that up. I need to press equals zero. And do you remember what I need after this? Comma. Now, if I typed in T, you need to do comma T. If you typed in X, do comma X. And I get two answers. Only one of them makes sense. The negative time does not make sense. Okay, so my time is two seconds. All right, what is her velocity on impact? Okay, so what we're trying to find out now is what is the velocity when this is happening right here? When t equals two seconds. That's when she hits the water. Well, we need a velocity equation, okay? We need to know what V of T is. And we just found out that velocity is the derivative of position, okay? So let's take, let's use the shortcut, let's use power rule and find a velocity. So we'd go two times negative 16, that would be negative 32. And then the power would go from squared two to one or just a plain T. And then plus, what's the derivative of 16t? Just 16. Because the power right now is 1. We go 1 times 16, and then the power would become 0, or you would not write a t. And then what is the derivative of 32? 0. zero. The derivative of a plain number with no t or x is 0. So here is now my velocity function. And I want to know what is the velocity on impact. So remember, that's happening at 2 seconds. So I want to find out what is V of 2. So we're just plugging in 2 right here. And so again, you can use your calculator. You could do this without a calculator. And it would give us negative 48 feet per second. So what can we deduce is happening with the diver at two seconds? Like what direction is she going? Down. Obviously she's hitting the water on her way down, right? That would be weird if it was the other way around. And that's why the velocity is negative. So if I wanted to know just what was the speed on impact, what would your answer be? 48. Just 48 feet per second without the negative. Okay, here we have the next question. When? When is a time? It's saying, what is the time when her velocity is equal to zero? So I'm going to write that. V of t equals zero. You get partial credit for just writing this stuff down, and it helps you kind of analyze the problem and know what to do next. Oh, I need to set my velocity expression, negative 32t plus 16. I need to set that equal to zero. And you could solve this by hand. Or you could use the solve feature on the calculator. It's really up to you. So go ahead and solve it on your own. You can check it with mine up here. getting a half point five yep okay what is actually happening with the diver at this time she stopped so she hits the water after two seconds 
So this is only a half second. So this has to be somewhere on her path from diving board, jumping up and into the water. When she's at her highest point. Yeah, when she's at her peak. Because what's happening is she goes up. Here's the diving board. She goes up. And for just a split second, her velocity is equal to zero, right? And then she goes down and hits the water. Um, this is why when I were graphing derivative, we look for those maxes and mins because that's where the rate of change is equal to zero. All right, what is her velocity at one second? This is just, again, asking to evaluate velocity at one second. So use your velocity expression. We're not setting it equal to one. We're plugging one in for time. I'm going to let you do this. You can kind of look up here to check your answers. Even if you don't have a calculator, you should be able to set them up. So from the half second during these two times as she's falling down into the water, is she speeding up or slowing down? Speeding up, right. Okay, so that's just one application of this derivative stuff. It's the main one, um, but we'll kind of come back to this a few times. Your test on Friday is gonna be no calculator. So the way I'm going to ask these questions are such that either the numbers are super easy to do without a calculator or I'll just ask you to set them up without simplifying them. Okay, turn the page and let's talk about higher order derivatives. So, so far I have been just saying the derivative. What I could have been saying is the first derivative. How do we call this? Y prime, right? Y prime or f prime of x, dy over dx, d over dx of f of x. This is all ways to show the derivative. Well, you can actually take a derivative multiple times, and that's with all this notation here. This is not something you need to memorize. Just count them. Okay, so like down here, there's four. There's four, four. This is the fourth derivative. So what does this mean? Why do we do it? Well, just a second ago, we talked about velocity being first derivative. In that same situation, what is the second derivative? What word do we use to show the rate of change of velocity? It starts with an A and ends in elation. Acceleration. Yes, acceleration. And there are others. Have any of you ever, ever heard of concave? concavity, concave versus convex back in geometry. Okay, that also has to do with the second derivative. And there are more, but that just kind of shows you there are some things that we're going to talk about eventually. Right now, we just need to practice the idea of taking the derivative more than once. So what is which derivative is this asking us to find? The third. There's no shortcut. There's nothing new. We're just going to find the first. And then we're going to find the second and then find the third. So this is just good review overall. What is the derivative of 5x to the sixth? Yeah, 30 because you'd multiply 6 times 5. And then the new power on x would become 5. five. You just subtract 1. Okay, so 6 times 5 is 30. Subtract 1, you get 5. All right, now who remembers what is the derivative of sine x? You guys are so smart. Derivative sine is cosine. Okay, so that's the first derivative. Now let's find the second derivative. Okay, so 5 times 30, 150. New power would just be subtracted by 1. All right, now this one was a little bit trickier. What's the derivative of cosine x? Negative sign. negative sign, so we should write a plus 3 sign x. I'm going to give you a little trick that may help you remember when you have a negative and when you don't. 
The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so two negatives make a plus. All right, now we're ready to find the third derivative, which is what it was asking us to do. We call this triple prime. So four times 150, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Here we go, 600 <laughs> x, subtract one from the power, and then the last term, should it be plus or minus? I mean, I already wrote the plus, so I kind of gave it away, but it should be plus three. Okay, because derivative of sine is just cosine, and that's your answer. That's what the third derivative is. If we were to keep going, what would eventually happen to this first group? It would to zero, right? Eventually it would become just a number, and that derivative would be zero, but this second part is just going to flip flop back and forth. All right, so here's my little thing. Imagine it's really hot outside, and you're like, I can tell you're like really burning up and I go hey here's a snow cone I'm gonna give that to you and then I go uh mm, I'm hot too I'm gonna take my snow cone away okay so I give you a snow cone and then I take it right back because I'm just that mean all right mm -hmm. so that's what this that's the scenario so let's see how this relates to this what we're doing in math the derivative of sine is cosine Derivative of cosine is negative sine. What do you think the derivative of negative sine is? Negative, negative cosine. And the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. This may or may not help you. It kind of just depends on how you work. All right, so I give you a snow cone and I take it away. That could be a way for you to keep those pluses and minuses straight. All right. Um, so linear approximations. Here's an application of why we do tangent lines. And I'm just going to kind of introduce this concept today, and we really won't practice it much this week. We'll get to it more later. Um, <clears throat> but I like it because it's good review of writing the equation tangent line, which we need anyway. So given this parabola, I want you to find the value of f of 1.1 without a calculator. Okay, and then I'm like, just kidding. Because obviously, who wants to put in 1 plus 1 squared? That's not impossible, but it's kind of annoying. Okay, so what we're going to do is approximate it. Let me show you why this works. So here's a parabola. And let's say right here is x equals 1. Then close to that would be x equals 1.1. Now in a curve... Even if two points are close to each other, the y values can be changing pretty drastically in a curve, okay? But if I drew a tangent line, you see how the point and the tangent, they're right on the same line. Their, their y values really aren't that different. So what we're going to do is find a tangent line. And we're going to approximate it. Eventually, I think this is something they may take off of the AP test because approximations just really don't have a lot of practical use now, but it is still something you need to know how to do. So the first thing we got to do is find the derivative. You should be really good at this by now, especially on something like this. So I want you to write down on your paper what the derivative is of this function. If you're struggling with this part, it does not mean you're dumb or, you, or anything. It means that you're missing something and we need to get it because this is not difficult for anyone to do. Everyone can do this. It could be that you just are missing a concept. So derivative of x squared, 2x. Derivative of negative 11x, negative 11. Derivative of 13, 0. So that's the first thing. Now we need to write the equation of the tangent line. For those of you who need to make up the quiz, you need to know how to do this process. This is a large part of the quiz. So to remember to write an equation of a line, you need a point. Now, typically they give you the x value of the point, but sometimes they give you the y value. Sometimes they make you work for it. And then the other thing you need is the slope. Okay, you can find either one of these first. We're gonna have to find both of them. So let's just find the y value. This means we have to go back up to the original. The y value is going to be plug in 1, 
1 squared minus 11 times 1 plus 13. Now, all day, a lot of people have been doing this math wrong. So before you say it, I want you to think, um, what is 1 squared minus 11 times 1 plus 13? Three is correct. I've been getting all sorts of weird stuff. So three. So that's the y value of the point. Notice I use the original function. Okay, to find the y value, you go back to the original. To find the slope, what do we use? Point slope. Well, we're going to write point slope here in a minute, but to find the slope, we're going to use the derivative. Remember, we call the derivative the slope function. So the slope is going to be 2 times 1 minus 11, which is negative 9. Okay, so use the original to find y, use the derivative to find slope. Then we use point slope. So my line should be y minus 3 equals negative 9x minus 1. And that's your answer. Okay, you don't have to simplify this. I am, though, because I know what we're about to do, I want to get y by itself. So look what I'm going to do. I'm not even going to distribute. I'm just going to go plus 3. This is a good way to do piecewise functions, by the way. Especially if, you, if your slope's a fraction, that can cause some problems, you know. If you wanted to simplify it, though, there's nothing wrong with that. You're not going to get the wrong answer. Totally fine. Okay, so all of what we just did, we've already done before. Here's the new stuff. We are going to evaluate the line for x equals 1.1. Okay, so my y value, I'm approximating, right? It's going to be negative 9, 1.1 minus 1, plus 3. And we're going to pretend this is multiple choice, so we have to actually multiply it all out. See how I left this in parentheses? 1.1 minus 1 should be pretty easy to do. 0.1. And then multiply it to negative 9, negative 0.9. So what is negative 0.9 plus 3? 2.1. Okay, that's the approximation. On the tangent line, okay, which is really close to the curve, the y value should be about 2.1. On the tangent line, it is 2.1. On the curve, it should be really close to 2.1. So let's see how close we were. Let's actually do, on the curve, f of 1.1. That's going to be 1.1 squared minus 11 times 1.1, and feel free to use your calculator for this. Like I said, I really think in the future this may be not something we teach, but we still do teach it. Still on the AP test, it's not really that hard to do. And you get a really close answer, okay, without even using a calculator. We got something really close. And imagine if you're like, oh, it wouldn't be that hard to do this by hand. Imagine if instead of squared, it had been to the fifth. The tangent line is always a line, no matter how crazy your derivative is. And we haven't even done super crazy derivatives yet. But okay. I'm going to get 